Today we're going to talk about uh, geopolitical delusions. Uh, just a little bit of an update on some things. If you want to see things from our uh, Fellowship Bible Chapel Prophecy Conference that we had last weekend, you can check our YouTube channel. Uh, there's about five teachings from uh, Randy Smith, maybe six, I don't know, and uh, one from myself on the restoration of Israel, and one from Mike Clapham on the Day of the Lord. And then um, next Sunday we're going to have Martine Erdman speaking here at church. And he'll also be teaching in uh, Prof, uh, Power to Stand in the second hour. And then the following Sunday, we're going to have Pastor David Nathan from South Africa here. Uh, he was raised as an Orthodox Jew, uh, very powerful teacher of God's Word. I highly recommend that you see him in two weeks, October 9th. So um, I really had a lot to look at this week. <laughs> um, it was way more than most weeks, and uh, I didn't even get finished uh, getting through everything, uh, even though spending a lot of time this morning and all day yesterday and one day this week. Uh, it just was a very, very busy week, and I've called it geopolitical delusions, and I think you'll see why in just a minute, because of what people always seem to pin the problem on, which is Israel and nothing else, but we talk each week about the convergence of the signs. And this week, uh, I'm not going to make an effort to tie a lot of things into Scripture, but we know that things are happening very quickly. They're happening very, very quickly. They're actually increasing in the speed with which they're coming about. And all of these things, I think, play into God's prophetic plan and purpose for the end times. But just a couple verses that we always refer to quite a bit. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, having a form of godliness, but denying the power of their own, from such turn away. And then over in Matthew chapter 24, it tells us that we're going to be persecuted. There's also things re referenced in Matthew chapter 24 that we can be looking for, wars and rumors of wars, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. But a lot of these things show that there is this very strong delusion afoot on planet Earth today. That's prophetic. And I know that it's very frustrating for Christians. Someone mentioned it to me this morning when she came in that, you know, I watch what's going on and it just makes me so angry. And that's okay, but we also have to keep in mind that, and I get angry too, believe me. I mean, I'm yelling at the radio and that type of thing when I'm driving around the state when I'm not running over little Bambi or whatever whatever the male name for Bambi would be. Um, Bambo, I guess. And uh, <laughs> So, but I, it, it does bother me, and I know, you know, there's good thinkers out there. By the way, a video you might want to go watch, uh, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, where my good friend Jack Hibbs, is pastor, had a uh, little one-day seminar, evening seminar for people in the church called, I think it was called Engage 2016. <clears throat> about how they can be engaged in the culture and politics and that type of thing. And they had Dennis Prager come and speak. And I really have a lot of respect for Dennis Prager. He's not a Christian. He knows you know, the difference between Christianity and Judaism, modern-day Judaism. And, uh, but he is a good thinker. And he's one of the people I, one of the few people I try to listen to every day, uh, podcast his show. I'd highly recommend it. He has great speakers on. Also, if you have young people, go and subscribe to Prager University. Uh, they started that a couple of years ago. I think it is now the, the largest private YouTube channel on the planet. Um, millions and millions of views, way beyond anything that we get here at our church. And he has good thinkers come in. They do these little five-minute courses. And you know his, his philosophy is, give me five minutes, I'll give you a semester. Well, he spoke the other night about the effects of leftism, which I talk a lot about here also. Uh, he spoke at that at Chino Hills the other night, and I highly recommend, we'll try to put a link up in the YouTube, uh, the notes that goes with this thing this morning. So I'm going to cover just a few things, and then we're going to focus on the um, globalist palooza that took place in New York City this week at the United Nations. But this was a... Um, found this, it was 
partly came out of an issue. Now, I don't read Cosmopolitan magazine, okay? I only, I blurred out the cover. You know, it's the Kardashians. You know, if you want to see that junk, you can go watch whatever channel they're on. I think they're on 24-7, for crying out loud. But there was an article in there where Gloria Steinem was quoted. And she went to a Planned Parenthood fundraiser in, I believe it was Memphis, Tennessee. And this is a, that's the front page of the commercial appeal. And they announced a $12 million fundraising goal. And she said something like this. Now, I can't remember if this came from Cosmopolitan Magazine or if this came from her speech that night that she gave this Planned Parenthood fundraising, Gloria Steinem. And she said this. We should have this massive education campaign pointing out that the Pope and all of the other patriarchal religions that dictate to women in this way, accusing them of global warming. Because the human flood, human load on this earth is the biggest cause of global warming, and that is because of forcing women to have children they would not on their own choose to have. So my suggestion is, Gloria Steinem, start with yourself, okay? And stop this. Listen, folks, you need to understand the totalitarian, totalitarian aspects of the left exist in every single thing that they do. And we saw it this week with the riots in Charlotte and everything else. And you need to understand that or you're not, you'll, you will lose your mind. I mean, you, you will say, I don't understand what's going on. Understand what's going on is, that is a very powerful religion. I would recommend, again, that if you want to read about it, a development of this is Michael Walsh's book, The Devil's Pleasure Palace, about how Marxism and leftism has overtaken academia and other institutions in our country. Now, I'm going to say this um, just because I think this is weird, and I can't explain it, and maybe I'm wrong. But this was Hillary Clinton supposedly speaking in Greensboro, North Carolina the other day. And when she came in, there was this big flag and there was these buntings and she walked up to the stage. And the, you can watch the video, and a number, number of people have pointed this out, is uh, she's walking up to the stage and there's this big American flag backdrop and there's all these, you know, this is what happens today is you see things, I mean, you're watching the riots in Charlotte. People are being beat up, shot, tear gassed, and what is going on? Everybody's got their iPhone out, you know, or their phone out taking pictures of everything. A year or so ago, a year ago, I was in Los Angeles, and I was at a gas station, and it was in a not very good area of Los Angeles near the airport. And I may have I may have told you this before, but as I'm standing there, I start to pump the gas, and all of a sudden, like 20 pieces of emergency equipment come rolling up to the intersection where I'm at with their sirens going on, cop cars, ambulances, uh, hook and ladder trucks, even though there's nothing over one story or two stories in that area. And people are getting out, guys are getting out with iPads, you know, the firemen, and I'm like, what is what's going on? Am I in the middle of a riot or something? And you know what? You know why I figured out that nothing was bad was happening? I looked around and nobody was doing this. Everybody was just standing there watching. They didn't have their phones out. So I figured if they didn't have their phones out, it was likely that nothing was going on. So I was safe. So but what you see in this picture is that the the pictures in the phones don't really match what's in the background. Uh, there's no flag. There's no flag buntings or anything like this. And so I, I don't know what's going on, okay? I'm just saying is um, the world is really weird now, okay? It's very strange. And um, I'm not one that, you know, jumps on this. As soon as a shooting happens someplace, Within five minutes now, there's some guy sitting, you know, in his mother's basement eating microwave mac and cheese saying, oh, that didn't really happen. It was all fake. It's just to create chaos and all this other stuff. And, um, but this one, doesn't, not, it doesn't match up. So now the, the problem with the way things are going is everybody set the bar so low with 
Hillary Clinton's health now, that if she happens to make it through the whole debate, it's going to dispel a lot of the things that have concerns that have grown up around that. Uh, this is something that's also happening. The Navy is to hold a halt hands training webinars on new transgender policy. This came from military.com. Uh, the other little political thing that I'll mention is, and you know, there are people sitting in their basement at their computer that are actually doing good investigative work. They're doing investigative work that the FBI doesn't seem to be able to do with all of their agents and all of their expertise and that type of thing. Uh, things that the Department of Justice can't do with all of their expertise and all their computers and everything. When they release some of the uh, Clinton emails, Hillary Clinton emails, a lady went through and she started looking on the internet and what she found out was the, the person who set up Hillary Clinton's uh, email server who came to Congress to testify and took the fifth, but the Fifth Amendment in response to every single question, actually had a, a username and was out on the internet asking for, how can I delete out, I have a PST file, if you save your all your Outlook emails in one file. It's called a PST file. And he goes, how can I go through that file and change the name of a VIP to something else? Well, now we found out that, and now he didn't use his real name when he was writing this and posting it on bulletin boards, but this person came up with, uh, found his name and then found other people who took pictures with him and said, hey, this is whatever the username he was going to uh, use, whatever he was using in there in, in that, on that bulletin board. And it was the guy who was Hillary Clinton's email webmaster. And, so all, and this was just somebody sitting in their basement or in their, at their computer searching the Internet and finding out and making all of these ties. This is a, in my view, this is a huge scandal. And now it comes out that President Obama was actually commuting with, communicating with Hillary Clinton on her private email server using a, a pseudonym of some kind. Like, I, I don't know, maybe it was not Barack Obama. I don't know. Maybe it was, it, I mean, it's so transparent. And this is a scandal. And this is just, um, here's what he said, this person. It was uh, Stone, Stone Tear, or Strong Stone Tear was the name of his. He said, hello, I may be facing a very interesting situation where I need to strip out of VIPs, parentheses, all caps, very VIP email address from a bunch of archived email that I have both in a live exchange mail, email, a mailbox, as well as a PST file. Basically, they don't want the VIP's email address exposed to anyone and want to be able to either strip out or replace the email address in the two from fields in all of the emails we want to send out. Does anybody have anything you can help me with on this? And this is the same guy that, and this is, to me, this is a scandal, and this is, somebody should be prosecuted. Many people should be prosecuted. Of course, they're giving immunity out like uh, you give out candy bars at Halloween when people come to your house. Uh, geopolitical diary from Stratfor, quantitative easing is nearing its limits. It makes reference in this article to, you know, quantitative easing as they keep pumping money, printing money, pumping it into the economy, pumping it, pumping it, pumping it. And they've been doing it now for eight years almost. Um, and they quote this report from the uh, Bank of International Settlements. And this, this report says this, an unexplored explanation. Uh, this is the title of the section. An unexplored explanation, bank regulation combined with unconventional monetary policy. What they're trying to figure it out is what's going on? Why isn't the economy growing? Why isn't pumping all this money in? What, we, we've never seen this before. We don't know what's, and this is the, these are supposedly the elites of the world, the banking elites, and they don't understand really what's going on. The article says this, while these policies, quantitative easing, could play an important role in explaining the contraction in cross-border bank lending, and it has been difficult to evaluate their effects empirically for several reasons. One of which is this, the temporal clustering of these different policies in direct response to the financial crisis in most countries makes disentangling their individual effects challenging. Okay, what does that say? We don't know what's going on. We can't explain how all of this is working now because we're in uncharted territory. And they are. 
And so all of these things point to a potential global crisis. I could show you articles about Germany being on the brink. I could show you articles about China being on the brink. I could show you any number of articles that, that seem to indicate that there's a global financial crisis of some kind coming in the near future. A year, two years, six months, a month, I don't know. It just is that everything that they're doing has never been done before, and to the extent that they're doing things that have been done before, the things that they're doing that have been done before don't work, ultimately. They cause more problems. And so this, I think, the important thing from what we've talked about here in Bible prophecy is this sort of kind of ties everything a little bit together. Another area of the world, let's go to geopolitics for the rest of this today. Um, when will Hillary and tr well, Trump and Hillary use the K word? What's the K word? It's the one, it's a major crisis in the world involving the second most populous nation on the world, India, and the sixth most, po most populous nation on the world, Pakistan, both of, both of which are nuclear powers and now having a very an increasing crisis that they're afraid may lead to war in Kashmir. There's always been a very a lot of dispute over the border in Kashmir between Pakistan and India. And this is sort of, as this article says in Foreign Policy, one of the unresolved things from the collapse of the British Empire and the partition of India in 1947 after World War II. And how does that all going to play out? And nobody knows. And it's one of those areas of the world where nobody really talks about it. When you, when you look at the world right now, it's very easy to come up with six or more areas of the world where a world war could be easily triggered with no problem. South China, Korea, Middle East, Syria, Ukraine, Kashmir. Um, it, it, it's just, it's everywhere. And uh, you have the immigration crisis in um, Europe as well. And I would suggest probably here in the United States too, but nobody talks about that. Um, this is something that I had not, I saw a number of articles on it this week, and I had no idea. In the last year, in Southeast Asia, they burn the land, they burn forest and jungle to clear the way for farmland. Because they need farmland because they have a lot of people to feed. So in Indonesia, Bangladesh, other places, as a result of those fires in the last year, over 100,000 people have died. Have you heard about this? Southeast fire is tied to deaths. Uh, U.S. study says that the smoke from blazes set to clear land for crops killed more than 100,000, and they actually have a chart that shows. So over 100,000 early deaths from carbon-based particulate matter in the last year. And nobody talk. it doesn't even make the radar. It doesn't even make the news until it's over 100,000 people. That's a lot of people. That's a couple, you know, large, small cities. In Russia, Putin, uh, his party won the election, and he considers this to be bolstering his mandate, as if he needed any more self-confidence. But if, if Vladimir was lacking in self-confidence, now he can, he can go forward more knowing that he has the support of more people in Russia. Uh, even though a lot of, they had a huge drop-off in the turnout for the election, and Putin is very pragmatic, he says, well, it doesn't make any difference, I won, that's all that matters. Uh, somebody, this is a graphic that uh, Stratfor came up with a while back, uh, how Russia views the world. Uh, you see Russia here, and it's, the world's flipped upside down. It's looking to the south. So, you know, this is Russia kind of looking out over all the things that it needs to control, and that's how Russia views the world. Russia's an interesting study. This is, uh, shows the Russian agricultural areas, and you can see the... Um, that line, which I don't think is quite accurate, I'd have to check, uh, I think it should be a little bit to the right, the, the bottom part of that line. 
But that's essentially where the Germans were stopped in World War II in 1942. That was about the extent of their furthest advance. But that area there to the left of the line is this great plain, uh, the Northern European plain that uh, the ge geographic scholars talk about is called the geographic, uh, Mackinder started it 100 years or so ago, the geographic pivot point of history. And that's where most of the major wars would start there or in the rim land, which would include the Middle East around there. Um, so if you look at Soviet Union population density, it's all over there towards Ukraine and up to uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's, they have a lot of wide open country. Um, what, I, what is it, 8,000 miles across Russia or seven or 8,000 miles. So it's a big problem. But people, I think, make a mistake when they believe too much of what Russia says and they ignore Russia. Uh, Russia is still a major military power even though they have essentially a leaky bucket for their aircraft carrier. Uh, they, can, they, they, were very, they were very excited when they were able to get it to go across the Black Sea recently. Um, it's the only aircraft carrier they have. But they do have an incredible missile capacity and other weapon capacity, and they're not to be trivialized. Geopolitical Futures, which is the new uh, think tank of George Friedman, also points out yet another trigger area that's existing on the planet, the Balkans, still the powder keg of Europe. The Balkans, of course, being the countries of former Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria. The area right now which are being overrun by this immigration crisis. And they, it, um, well, this is what Friedman says in his article about the Balkans. The 20th century began and ended with European wars. World War I was a global conflict, but its immediate cause was competition in the Balkans. The end of the century was punctuated by smaller conflicts resulting from the disintegration of Yugoslavia. He goes on to say, Europe likes to think that it put its demons to rest after World War II, that the EU is the manifestation of peace coming uniformly to the continent, and that war is gone from Europe once and for all. This is a noble delusion, made no less delusional by its no nobility. And he says this couple points he makes. If the rest of Eurasia, and that would be the area of you know, the former Soviet Union, the Stan Republics, and the Middle East, Syria, you know, that area between Europe and, and, and the main part of Asia. If the rest of Eurasia looks similar to how it looked before World War II, the Balkans look similar to how they looked prior to World War I. In other words, they're a powder keg waiting to explode. The resolution of the current Balkan crisis depends on the way these countries decide to act, and they all have very little room, in, room to maneuver considering the complexity of their problems. They have, their economies are in the tank, they have high unemployment, they have ethnic conflicts, religious conflicts. It's a powder keg. And that's where you know, the assassination of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire Crown Prince in 1914 in Sarajevo, uh, which later became Yugoslavia. Um, that's where World War I, that was sort of the trigger for World War I. And so the, the similarity, the thing that you should look for is, we know prophetically that the scriptures say that there are these wars coming. The question is, that I always ask, that I always look for is, what's going to trigger it? And I think this is what geopolitical uh, experts try to do all the time, analysts, they try to figure out, what, what can go wrong and what can cause this, this dispute here to explode into a world war? And the answer is, we don't really know. We know that these wars are coming prophetically, but what triggers them, what's the, the spark that sets it off is we don't really know. And that's what we try to look at here a little bit and analyze and see if we can kind of piece that together. So that's the Balkans. Uh, Friedman also has a great article this week. I subscribe to Geopolitical Futures in Stratford just because I get a lot of good secular-based thinking and uh, analysis there. I don't always agree with it, but Friedman makes a good point. He says, this is, the, this is the Middle East in 2001, 15 years ago, before 9-11. And 
we still talk about it as if that's the Middle East that still exists. We talk about the conflict in Syria. We talk about the conflict in Iraq. We talk about the conflict in Yemen or other places. Those countries really don't exist anymore. And so Friedman did a good thing. He put out a new map, Libya. He put out a new map and showed the areas of influence, the blue areas of the Islamic State. Uh, the dark blue area up there is uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, which is really kind of emerging as an independent country, much to the chagrin of what's left of where people live in Iraq, much to the chagrin of Turkey, much to the chagrin of Iran, because they don't want the Kurds to have their own country. And then the, to the left of that dark blue area, there's a place called Rojava, which is the Syrian Kurdistan. Kurds have come into that area. Now Turkey's moving into that area and pushing back. I showed a little video about that. So I, what I'm saying is that we sit here uh, in relative comfort and peace in the United States, and we talk about things as if they are still the same, like uh, Syria. But the, the Syrian war, the Syrian conflict. There is no more Syria, okay? There are pieces of what used to be Syria. But we sit here, and in just 15 years, the map changed. And it's a powder keg that may be the trigger for some of the final wars that we see in Bible prophecy. Uh, John Maudlin also has an article by Friedman, I guess this is George Friedman Sunday, over at uh, his model in economics, um, why Syria matters to, your, to you, that starts off with this. Syria is drawing in major global and regional powers. When, for example, the U.S. and Russia are engaged in a country with very different goals and supporting hostile factions, it is certainly not something to dismiss out of hand. On the contrary, Syria matters a great deal. If nothing else, it has become a test of the strength of powers with interests far beyond Syria. Now tomorrow, Friedman is going to do a free online seminar at 2 o'clock. Uh, I'll try to put it in the, um, the notes for the YouTube video. You can go and sign up for free and watch it. You just have to give your email address, which means you'll have to, if you don't want to get the emails, it'll come after that. Just unsubscribe. Called Crisis and Chaos, Are We Moving Toward World War III? Now, Friedman is very conservative in the sense of he's not a, um, you know, somebody uh, throws a hand grenade in Iran and, or in Iraq, and he says, oh, it's the beginning of World War III. Or you see these people on YouTube putting up videos all the time. World War III, I remember there was one guy, he sits at his dining room table, he gets like 500,000 views, and he... He has a whiteboard, and he's like, um, I won't give his name because I don't want you to waste your time going to watch him. But he was there last year. World War III is going to begin in Saudi Arabia and Syria before the end of February. Oops. So here we are nine months later, to eight months later, nothing. And there's a lot of people who are prone to do this today, and I really try not to do that. Uh, you know, it, there may be some Sunday when I walk here and say, you know, run for the hills and, uh, or something, or um, let me hold all your gold while you run for the hills. And, um, but th there will come, but Friedman is very conservative. And when a guy like George Friedman and a guy like John Maudlin, who's a pretty good economic thinker, when they start talking about World War III, I think it's really time for people to sit up and take notice. So there's a free, thing tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I won't be able to watch it, so if somebody want to watch it, uh, I have a real estate matter to take care of tomorrow afternoon at a local country club. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm only, I, have, I have to do it. I'm sorry. I, okay, let's look at what went on this week. That's a long, that took a lot longer than I thought. Last week, there was um, a man who planted a bunch of bombs around New York, New Jersey. A number went off, a couple at least went off. They found, I believe there were 11 explosive devices that they ultimately found. When the initial call came out, the call was to go, that there was a Hispanic man 
who was being looked for as a person of interest. The, that night, last weekend, last Saturday night, there was the stabbing, I mentioned this last Sunday, at a mall in St. Cloud, Minnesota, about 70 miles west of Minneapolis. It um, was very clear from surveillance videos and things that were released who they should be looking for. But they never used the word, okay? They never did. Um, you see here, this is the headline. They finally got the guy. Uh, he was Pakistani, Muslim, in the New York shooting. Police are concerned. This is from, I think, the, one of the newspapers I looked at, I think the Wall Street Journal. Attacks on random low-profile targets raise concern about other soft locales. Because, you know, we've invested a lot of money in protecting skyscrapers. You, know, you go to big buildings in New York. Even in Columbus, you got to sign in at the desk. I'm not sure what that does, um, because if somebody destroys the building, the paper you signed in on is probably going to be gone too. But it makes every it's it's sort of this little theater that we engage in to make everybody feel safer. But when you really think about it, what what does it really do? But there are a lot of soft targets. There are a lot of targets where there are gun-free zones, and almost every one of these happens in a gun-free zone. When they caught the, the um, Somali guy, they killed the Somali guy in St. Cloud, Minnesota, he was just a normal American kid. What, what concerns me about what's happening is that the news media and our politicians and even our military leaders, I think, have lost the ability to speak truthfully about what's really going on. And there's risk to speaking truthfully about it. I mentioned my friend Jack Hibbs. He talked about a certain religion in his service on 9-11. That video has been banned by YouTube in Germany and the United Kingdom. Can't watch it because he mentioned that religion. I'm not making it up. And You'll see in a moment, well, I'll talk about it in just a moment. So here is the guy in New York. They found his diary when they arrested him. He was shot, injured. He was building the bombs and testing them in his backyard. But nobody says anything. Why? Because if you do, you're the problem. It's, everything is upside down. When I talk about geopolitical delusion, the title of today's thing, I mean there's geopolitical delusion. People are deluding themselves to avoid talking about what the real problem is. And when people, even people in the Muslim community who come forward and say we need to reform Islam or it's over, they're immediately attacked by people like CARE that you know, they don't know what they're talking about, they're misinterpreting the Quran and all this. They're the ones who want to reform it. And they're the ones who are attacked. Because what they have to do is change it into a different religion, unfortunately. And then there was this mall shooting in the Seattle, I think it was in the Seattle area, a uh, couple days ago. Four or five people were killed. And what was the... What was the all points bulletin that went out? We're looking for a Hispanic male. Okay, now look, I looked at the video. I, I, here's what I don't understand. If I get up here and say that the person is actually from Pakistan, I get labeled as a bigot. The news media has video of what happened, and they call the person a Hispanic, but they're never the bigot. They're biggest, bigger racist than anybody else. I mean, they're, they keep pinning it on Hispanic people. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know other people who do that who are looking at that religion. But it's okay for the news media to denigrate a whole race of people who aren't doing that. 
You understand? But they're okay, but certain presidential candidates, I mean, the Washington Post had a thing the other day, three or four articles, they were calling Trump Hitler. Okay? It's geopolitical delusion. I rest my case. <laughs> and so they caught this guy, and he's a Turkish immigrant Muslim in Seattle shooting. They caught him last night. But even our, this is the report from the Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security. Potentially eligible individuals have been granted U.S. citizenship because of incomplete fingerprint records. So the people that we rely on to protect us, they had people, they were all set to be deported. There were, they admit to about 900, it's probably double that number. These were people who were convicted felons and that sort of thing that should have been deported. And what did Homeland Security do? Granted them citizenship status. And now they can vote. <laughs> so Brett Stevens um, has a good article in the Wall Street Journal the other day, Life During Wartime. He says this, as attacks become more frequent and closer to everyday life, public tolerance for liberal pieties will wane. I think he's, I think he's dreaming, okay? I, I don't think it'll happen. I, I think people will, there's a thing called the Stockholm, Stockholm Syndrome. And I think we're seeing that operate on a massive level. So let's look at this. Well, look at this, and um, the UN geopolitical globalist palooza that took place at the UN in New York City this week. The Washington Post had a good article, or the New York Times, a look at the UN record on urgent global issues. And what did they find? They don't do very well anywhere. <coughs> Their forces are not very good and that type of thing. And I know there's a lot of concern that the UN's going to come in here and take over the United States. They have about 130,000 troops, as, as best as I can tell, about 130,000 UN troops worldwide, and they don't do a very good job. So I personally am not that concerned about it. I think, frankly, we'll surrender, most people will surrender voluntarily just under that threat. But I, I see it all the time. You know, every time a a personnel troop carrier is moved by a National Guard from one place to the other. The internet is filled with videos. They're enacting martial law. There's, you know, and so I just would encourage people to calm down a little bit. I know that all this stuff is coming, okay? And, but I don't think people should worry about it. <laughs> That's, but don't surrender to it either, I guess, is another thing. World leaders at the UN summit adopted a bold plan to enhance protections for refugees and migrants. They issued a report. All the member states did it. They called it a historic summit. Uh, world leaders came together at the United Nations General Assembly to adopt a New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, which expresses the political will of world leaders. I don't think it expresses the political will of the people that they govern to protect the rights of refugees and migrants, to save lives, and share responsibility for large movements on a global scale. So again, the UN has these massive plans. They're going to take care of the immigration problem. Fantastic. This is why I don't worry about the UN that much right now. This was in the New York Times this morning. UN delays negotiations on refugee pact until 2018. The article says this. By the way, Angela Merkel came out and met, you know, I probably handled the migrant thing wrong. It says this in the article, another complicating factor behind the delay was that it remains unclear which countries are willing to take in refugees. Oops, yeah, that would be sort of a critical component of a plan to take in refugees that you actually have countries that want to step up and volunteer to do that, and everybody's backing off. Many remain reluctant to host migrants in a surge in anti-immigrant sentiment as well as security fears after a series of terror attacks in Europe, dot, 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 and the United States of America in the last five days, I would add, as well as security, uh, which some of the perpetrators posed as refugees when entering the continent. So all these world leaders came. 
You can go to the UN website if you're inclined to uh, waterboard yourself, you know, torture yourself, and watch all of these speeches. You could read the transcripts. They're all there. Um, many leaders link Middies conflicts with terrorism and refugees. But there was one country that they blame more than any, and guess which one that was? Israel. Here's uh, Ban Ki-moon, who gave his opening statement. Uh, just a couple short clips from him. I also stand before you with deep concern. Gulfs of mistrust divide the citizens from their leaders. Extremists push people into camps, into camps of us and them. The earth assails us with rising seas, record heat, and extreme storms. And danger defines the days of many. 130 million people need life-saving assistance. Tens of million, millions of them are children and young people. Our next generation already at risk. Yet, after 10 years in office, I'm more convinced than ever that we have the power to end the war, poverty, and persecution. We have the means to prevent conflict. We have the potential to close the gap between rich and poor and to make rights real in people's lives. This is what I mean by geopolitical delusion. It's worse than I've ever seen, but I'm very optimistic that we've got the tools to solve the problem. They don't. They won't. We know what the ultimate solution and answer is, the return of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to save it. He goes on uh, to say this. With the Sustainable Development Goals, we have a manifesto for a better future. With the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, we are tackling the defining challenge of our time. Climate change is the defining thing, but... More protected and complex, governance failures have pushed societies past the brink. Radicalization has threatened social cohesion, precisely the response that violent extremists seek and welcome. The tragic consequences are on brutal display from Yemen to Libya and Iraq, from Afghanistan to the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin. In today's world, the conflict in Syria is taking the greatest number of lives and sowing the widest instability. There is no military solution. Many groups have killed many innocents, but none more, none more so than the government of Syria, which continues to barrel, barrel bomb neighborhoods and systematically torture thousands of detainees. Just when we think it, it cannot get any worse, the bar of depravity sinks lower. Yesterday's, yesterday's a sickening, savage, and apparently deliberate attack on a UN Syrian Arab Red Crescent aid convoy is the latest example. The United Nations has been forced to suspend aid convoys as a result of this outrage. The humanitarians delivering life-saving aid were heroes. Those who bombed them were cowards. So what happened is a reference that he's making to a, an attack in Syria where uh, an aid convoy was attacked. And of course, uh, Russia and Syria blame the United States. The United States and other people blame Russia yeah, or Syria. Uh, the best things that I think people have pieced together, it does appear that there were barrel bombs dropped on this convoy. And a barrel bomb is a very uh, lethal thing. It essentially goes off. It's dropped from about 10,000 feet, it's, and it explodes. It like sucks the air right out of you. It burns people, causes massive destruction. 
when you look around and you see all the buildings in Aleppo and Damascus and Homs and all the Syrian cities, th those are done by um, grenades, the, the, the massive damage that you see. Those, those, that has to be done by bombs. And a lot of times the Syria will do it because it's, it's a relatively cheap bomb to make, I believe. And they can deliver it by a helicopter. They don't even need a, uh, a plane. It's not very precise. It's not what you would call a precise uh, laser-guided munition. But it causes a lot of destruction and damage. And listen, what's going on, and in, in there were t attacks in Aleppo again this week, they're trying to get the people to leave. Uh, you remember the uh, one of the, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, went to Congress and testified, and he said what they're doing is they're, they're making people, they're weaponizing refugees. They're making them pick up and move someplace else. I can't remember the general or CIA director, whoever it was that said that. I played the clip many months ago. And this is what continues to happen. They're just trying to get people, look, if you're not going to submit to the Syrian regime, then we're going to bomb Aleppo where you won't, to the point where you won't be able to live there and you're going to move someplace else anyway, and we'll have control of that area. Um, so there is a government that's called the Syrian government. They occupy a little strip of land now, mainly along the coast. Uh, so there's a lot of who, who's, everybody's blaming who, who, everybody's blaming each other. The U.S. and Russia really got into it this week, uh, fighting about who caused this. Um, Russia was, you know, calling for the Security Council to meet. Samantha Powers was saying to the, saw a clip of her saying to the Russian ambassador to the U.N., you're kidding me, right? You want to go to the Security Council over this? And so... It, all it just says is that this is a potential trigger area where this could quickly devolve into a much, much larger conflict. A lot of people say it already is World War III in a sense that proxies of the U.S. are fighting proxies of Russia and other things. So, but here was Ban Ki-moon uh, sort of wrapping up with what he thinks is one of the really, really big problems in the world. One year ago, Palestine's proudly raised its flag at UN headquarters. Yet the prospects for a two-state solution are being lowered by the day. All the while, the occupation grinds into its 50th year. As a friend of both Israeli and Palestinian peoples, it pains me that this past decade has been 10 years lost to peace. 10 years lost to illegal settlement expansion, 10 years lost to intra-Palestinian divide, growing polarization and hopelessness. This is madness, replacing a two-state solution with a one-state con construct would spell doom, denying Palestinians their freedom and rightful future, and pushing Israel further from its vision of a Jewish democracy towards greater global isolation. Well, the King of Jordan uh, came to the UN also. I mean, it was a parade of one leader after the other. And like I said, go to the UN website and you can see all their transcripts. You can see the whole videos. Uh, you can listen to them in any kind of any language that you want almost, uh, the major languages. Uh, so he came, and of course he spoke. The thing you need to remember is that as he was coming to New York to speak, they had elections in Jordan, and the Islamist party uh, sort of had some success in the Jordanian elections. So I think that's probably what colored his remarks. Now everybody paints the King of Jordan as a reasonable guy. I think he was educated in America, at least part of his education. He speaks very good English. But uh, he's a Muslim, and he had some things to say about the Palestinian-Israeli issue. No injustice has spread more bitter fruit than the denial of a Palestinian state. And I say peace is a conscious decision. Israel has to embrace peace or eventually be engulfed in a sea of hatred, in a region of turmoil. Safeguarding Jerusalem is a key concern, 
the holy city is strategic linchpin not only for my region but for the world this is a priority for me personally and for all Muslims and we utterly reject attacks on Muslim and Christian holy sites and any attempts to alter the historic Muslim Christian and Arab identity of the holy city as the custodian of Islamic holy sites in Jerusalem I will continue my efforts to protect these places and stand up against all violations of their sanctity including attempts for temporal and spatial division of Al-Aqsa Mosque, Al-Haram al-Sharif. He left somebody out. I, I was just waiting for him to mention the Jewish holy sites in Jerusalem. He just said Christian and Arab or Christian and Muslim. Listen, I, you know, I was in Jordan once. Uh, probably if they see this, I'll never be able to go there again. But uh, we went to Petra 20 years or so ago. And we spent a night in Amman. And what you find if you look at a map in Jordan 20 years ago, and I'm sure I'm 100% certain that this is the case today, you will find that west of the Jordan River, there is no Israel on the map. And so everybody portrays Jordan as a great friend of Israel and that sort of thing. And I just say I think that's a bunch of baloney uh, because they're not. They would like to see the Jews driven into the sea just like everybody else. They're just a little bit gentler in the way they say it. Um, and I think he's probably a nice guy, too. I, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, you know. But I'm just saying is I think his religion will overrule that. But he did identify himself as the custodian of the holy places. Um, but he never mentioned the Jews. Well, another guy who showed up, I guess he's got his, the coup tamped down and enough people in prison that he feels safe leaving the country, was Erdogan from um, uh, Turkey. Uh, he said this, uh, well, he said this in his speech. Uh, in the first quarter of the 21st century, humankind has reached the peak in its achievements in science, technology, economic development, and health. However, this picture also has a disgraceful dark face. And he goes on to this, and he says this, allowing the Palestinian people to live in an independent Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital is an obligation of the international community towards the Palestinian children especially Israel, should show respect to the sanctity of Haram al-Sharif. Uh, in case you don't know what that is, it's the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And put an end to violations regarding its status. The uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia also showed up at, the, uh, at this little globalist palooza. Uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Naif bin Abdul Aziz al Saud, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and he had this to say in his speech. The Palestinian issue remains an ongoing challenge to the United Nations. Israel continues its military occupation, terrorist practices, and acts of aggression. This long standing issue can only be solved by an end to the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territory along with the rest of the occupied Arab territories, including the Syrian Arab Golan, southern Lebanon, etc. Achieving any progress in ending the Palestinian conflict seems impossible in light of the continuation of the Israeli settlement policy, the tampering with the holy city of Jerusalem, tampering with the holy city of Jerusalem, ruining the Islamic and Christian identity of the city. I guess he forgot also and the heartless policy of repression practice against the Palestinian people. By the way, one commenter on the YouTube channel after I did my Restoration of Israel thing said that I had to have been raised in an Israeli family to have said the things that I said in that video. And he's banned, <laughs> and the comment has been removed, but I saved it just for self uh, reference you know I need to find my Israeli parents I guess that I just 
Saudi Arabia is in economic turmoil as well with the decline of the uh, price of oil. Of course, the Iranian, the great moderate Iranian, came to the UN. You know, the guy that we all pinned our hopes on. He's more moderate than Khamenei, but he doesn't have any power unless Khamenei lets him have the power. And he can't run for office unless Khamenei lets him run for office. But he's the great moderate. He's going to be the moderating influence in Iran, and everything's going to be great. And they're going to turn around. They're going to stop building nuclear weapons, and they're going to treat the... What did he do? He blamed Zionist pressure groups for continued, san... for continued sanctions on Iran. He also took in the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Uh, then it's interesting. There are a number of member states that are recognized at the UN, maybe close to 200. And if you go to their website, general, the general debate, you know, it says the dates. And down here in the corner, you have this uh, where you can do a search on choose speaker and country. You see that? And then there's a little drop down thing. And when you hit the drop down, it gives you the countries that are member states of the UN, except there's one there that is not really a member state because it's not a state. It's never been a state. But they engage in this charade, this charade, that, that yeah, there really is a Palest Palestinian state. It is what? Geopolitical delusion. It's not there. They think it's there. And, of course, the leader of this non-state state came and spoke, and he said, you know, we're going to, he laid out what they're going to try to do, and one of the things he did was he's going to continue to lobby the Security Council resolution on settlements. Um, in other words, they're going to try to get a Palestinian state recognized at the UN. Now, to date, that's been introduced, talked about, negotiated at the UN for decades. And the U.S. has always vetoed it if it vetoed it if it ever got close. Uh, he he talked. Uh, here's the, you have a transcript of his talk. Here are some of the things from his talk that he said. A couple of paragraphs. The 1993 Oslo Accords were intended to end the occupation and achieve the independence of the state of Palestine within five years. Yet Israel reneged on the agreements it signed and to this moment persists with its occupation and continues to expand its illegal settlement enterprise which undermines the realization of the two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 borders. Israel's disrespect and contemptuous policies have even led to attempts to legalize the settlements and the settlers colonizing our occupied land since 1967. It even led to the point of Israeli Prime Minister claiming that the call, we played this clip last week, that the call for cessation of settlements and their dismantlement and evacuating settlers constitutes ethnic cleansing. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu said that it was ethnic cleansing because it is ethnic cleansing. There's no other way to describe it. And they would never tolerate Israel sending all the Palestinians out of the state of Israel but we can get rid of the Jews and make it Jew-free. That's Hitlerian, okay? So then, who is perpetrating ethnic cleansing? In this regard, I am compelled to again warn that the Israeli government in, is doing, in pursuit of its expansionist settlement plans, will destroy whatever possibility and hopes are left for the two-state solution on the 1967 borders. So that was Mahmoud Abbas. The continuation of the Israeli aggression against our Muslim and Christian holy sites. He did it too. He forgot the Jews. He forgot them. Geopolitical delusion. All these Israeli policies, actions, and measures are the reasons for the failure of all international efforts, particularly that of the International Quartet, for the past 13 years, just as Israel has sabotaged the efforts of successive Amer American administrations over the years. Prime Minister Netanyahu came. He actually had a meeting with um, President uh, Obama. Obama came and um, gave 
if everybody called it his final address to the UN. Um, let's hope. <laughs> um, <coughs> let's hold him to that. Uh, I would say his final scheduled address to the UN. That's how I always refer to it. All lines all over the world needs a course shift in world conflict. And, of course, here's the transcript. You can go read the transcript of his speech. Uh, he said a few things like this, and yet around the globe we are seeing the same forces of global integration that have made us interdependent and also, also exposed deep fault lines in the existing international order. And, you know, he's right. All of these efforts, all of these efforts of man to build this global order, to the extent that they're successful, they will ultimately fail because it's not based on the right thing. But they'll can do it. He said this, young people need a global education in order to thrive. And what is true in the Middle East is true for all of us. Surely religious traditions can be honored and upheld while teaching young people science and math rather than intolerance. Because, of course, intolerance only comes from what? Religion. Okay? Your leftism, Mr. President, is a religion, and you're as intolerant as anybody I've ever seen in my life. And so, okay, so I have a clip. Should I play it or not, of Obama? Let's, okay, it's 52 seconds. So, it's under a minute. I think that's the tolerance. That's when you become intolerant, I know. But we have to put our money where our mouths are. And we can only realize the promise of this institution's founding to replace the ravages of war with cooperation if powerful nations, like my own, accept constraints. Sometimes I'm criticized in my own country for professing a belief in international norms and multilateral institutions, but I am convinced that in the long run, giving up some freedom of action not giving up our ability to protect ourselves or pursue our core interests, but binding ourselves to international rules over the long term enhances our security. And I think. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, one more clip, though. This is a few minutes long. I'm, gonna, I'm already a little bit over, not too bad. Um, this one. I have this, and then I have a little bit of an article of Caroline Glick I want to share because I think it ties everything together. So give me six or seven minutes if you can. If you have to leave, I understand. Um, but we're making notes of everyone that gets up. No. <laughs> um, so here's uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, and I only had time to pull this out of his, his speech, but I think this is pretty good. Is going to shock you. Israel has a bright future at the UN. Now I know that hearing that from me must surely come as a surprise because year after year I've stood at this very podium and slammed the UN for its obsessive bias against Israel. And the UN deserved every scathing word. That there's hardly anybody there when he speaks. That's the Israeli delegation. Uh, they all stay. For the disgrace of the General Assembly that last year passed 20 resolutions against the democratic state of Israel and a grand total of three resolutions against all the other countries on the planet. Israel 20, rest of the world 3. And what about the joke called the UN Human Rights Council, which each year condemns Israel more than all the countries of the world combined, as women are being systematically raped, murdered, sold into slavery across the world, 
which is the only country that the UN's Commission on Women chose to condemn this year. Yep, you guessed it, Israel. Israel. Israel, where women fly fighter jets, lead major corporations, head universities, preside twice over the Supreme Court, and have served as Speaker of the Knesset and Prime Minister. And this uh, circus continues at UNESCO. UNESCO, the UN body charged with preserving world heritage. Now, this is hard to believe, but UNESCO just denied the 4,000 year connection between the Jewish people and its holiest site, the Temple Mount. That's just as absurd as denying the connection between the Great Wall of China and China. Ladies and gentlemen, the UN, begun as a moral force, has become a moral farce. So when it comes to Israel at the UN, you'd probably think nothing will ever change, right? Well, think again. You see, everything will change and a lot sooner than you think the change will happen in this hall because back home your governments are rapidly changing their attitudes towards Israel and sooner or later that's going to change the way you vote on Israel at the UN Caroline Glick, I think, does a good job of tying a couple pieces together. And I'll go through this pretty quickly. Go to the Jerusalem Post Friday website. You can find her article. We'll put the link up in the show notes. I think we'll actually maybe do that this week. Um, So I forget what else. Oh, the George Friedman link for his seminar tomorrow. But essentially, rather than go through the whole thing and read a lot of her article, you can read it for yourself. But she does a, a... a, her characteristically brilliant job of analyzing events. And what she talks about is this, this photo op, you can watch the video of the meeting between Obama and Netanyahu in New York on uh, um, the 21st, which I guess would be Wednesday or Thursday. And she um, talks about the fact that one of the things they were talking about was this memorandum of understanding, this 10-year agreement, that Obama insisted on getting done. Now, listen, I think her analysis is spot on. Why did Obama insist on getting this 10-year agreement done with Israel right now? Politics, right? Don't we have an election coming up? And isn't there another leftist running for the presidency that he wants to help support? So he says, look look at at more money than anybody has ever given Israel. Any other president, look how great I am patting himself on the back. But I think Caroline Glick makes a good uh, point in this article. Now let me just find a couple of her references. Um, But the Memorandum of Understanding says that Israel can't go to Congress to get more during those 10 years. Now I think the next president, if it's Trump, could go in and tear up the agreement and do a new one, and nobody would care. But Obama's trying to get this in place for 10 years, and he's trying to undermine Congress. And so she says this, uh, the day the agreement was concluded in Geneva, and even before lawmakers had the chance to read it, the administration anchored the deal in a binding UN Security Council resolution. He's talking about the Iranian agreement. Remember, we have a thing in the United States called the Constitution. The Constitution says that If there's a treaty with the foreign government, it has to be approved by two-thirds of the Senate, two-thirds vote of the Senate. So when the Iranian deal came up, Obama knew he couldn't get that thing passed in the Senate, so what did he do? He said, well, it's not really a treaty, but then he went and he got the UN Security Council to adopt it and approve it so that it would sort of effectively 
undermine the ability of Congress to go in and vote against it later. Because it's international law now. This is one of those things where we have to submit to the global order, you know. Give up a little bit of our freedom, folks. Do you understand? This analysis by Caroline is just absolutely brilliant. Now, if Congress fails to respect the deal or if Obama's successor disavows it, the U.S. will face the prospect of Iran arguing that it is free to build bombs at will since the U.S. breached the deal. They're already breaching it anyway. As for Israel, Obama routinely sought to slash U.S. funding for Israel's last missile defense programs. Congress, in turn, routinely overrode him and expanded U.S. funding for Iron Dome and David Sling. Congress isn't the only casualty of Obama's memorandum of understanding. Because they took out the ability of Israel to go to Congress to get more money, the MOU also strikes a body blow to APAC. Since his first days in office, Obama has made a goal of weakening APAC. He's lined up with J Street, the anti-Jewish Jewish organization. For APAC, Obama's MOU is a disaster. In one fell swoop, he took away its main lobbying operation, the one that was guaranteed to succeed in passing with massive bipartisan support. Following the deal, APAC will be hard-pressed to maintain even a semblance of the power it held when Obama entered into office. I'm telling you, this is brilliant stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, she grew up in Chicago. I, I, you know, she must, I don't know. It's possible to grow up in the, in a, in the midst of, you know, bad thinking and, and come out okay. For Obama, the MOU isn't about securing military financing for Israel. The aid is a legal means for him to achieve a different aim. Administration and congressional sources warn that Obama wished to conclude the MOU in the final months of his presidency to burnish his pro-Israel credentials. He wants his pro-Israel bona fides intact as he enables the UN Security Council to adopt an anti-Israel resolution just after the U.S. presidential election in November. Do you understand what's going on? He gets, he gets the MOU. That lets him to undermine APAC. I'm telling you. He's brilliant in a, in a very devious sort of way. People under mes, underestimate him, and that has been the downfall of many that oppose him in this country. He is brilliant in the way he does this. So he gets the MOU, he gets Congress out of the picture, he gets APAC out of the picture, he gets the political thing to help his replacement get into office, continue his policies, continue his legacy, but now, after the election, he can go and do what he's wanted to do for eight years. Get a resolution supporting the state of Palestine and against Israel. That's been his ultimate goal. For the past year and a half, the French have been sitting on such a resolution. If passed, the French draft Security Council resolution will require Israel to accept a deal with the Palestinians that would require it to withdraw to the 1949 armistice lines with minor adjustments and partition Jerusalem within 18 months, or face the prospect of the nations of the world recognizing a sovereign state of Palestine in a formal state of war with Israel. Does not the Bible <laughs> say that in the last days the nations will come. I think nobody expected the lead for that to come from the United States of America. That opposition. And if he does this, and all indications are that he will, he'll do it after the election so you know who gets elected. So she won't have to deal with people who support Israel being upset that might also support her. After the presidential election, the French draft can be pulled out for a quick vote while U.S. Ambassador Samantha Powers is in the ladies' room. So just watch what's going on. It does really line up with Bible prophecy, and we're way over time, and we got to go. So next week, Martine Erdman, following week, David Nathan. I'll be doing updates each of the next two weeks. Pray, Father. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would have mercy on the deluded leaders of the world. 
and that in your grace, you might stop this insanity. You will get people to turn their hearts to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, the only hope for humanity. Lord, I pray that you will steal our minds and our hearts in the days and weeks and months and years to come. In Jesus' name, amen.